Hi, I'm Daniel Holchin. And I'm Patrick Devine, and we are engineers at VMware. And we want to introduce a new project that we've been working on called BuildKit CLI for Kube Control, which we realize is a bit of a mouthful. So we've been working with containers and container technology for about seven years now. We actually worked at Docker for about five years. So one of the things that Docker really did well was they had a really good way of building and running container images. It's just two steps in the CLI. You do a Docker build and a Docker run. I actually, when I was working at Docker, I worked on Docker doodles, if anyone knows what those are. Um, being able to iterate using build and run made creating those Docker doodles, it was a really fast process. So Kubernetes is great as an operations platform, but it's not quite as easy to use as a developer platform, but we think it could be. So I'm going to do a, a quick demo of a new doodle that I've actually created. So let me explain a little bit about what we've got here. This is a single node cluster, a single node kube cluster, which is uh, set up on my Mac laptop. Um, it's running Minikube, and, uh, but this should work just as well on any other flavor of Kubernetes as well too. I've already gone ahead and installed the kube control build client, which I'm just gonna run here. Um, and so what this is doing, because I haven't run kube control build yet, it's setting up a builder. Uh, which is, you know, if you run the subsequent times that you're not going to need to go through that particular step first. But now what it's doing is taking the Docker file, which I have sitting inside of this directory, and it's going and building the various different stages of this. And in fact, there's a, a cache miss, um, which is why it, it's trying to pull part of the outline. Um, it's going and getting some of the dependencies, which are uh, specified inside of the Docker file. And now it's actually compiling this particular uh, doodle. So now that that's actually been loaded by um, by the builder it, into the local Docker runtime, I can go ahead and do a kube control run to run to create a, a pod and run it directly. And so there we go. This is funny. Awesome. All right, so let's take a little bit, let's take a look at how this actually works. Uh, so as you saw in the demo, the first thing uh, that happens when the CLI runs is it checks to see if there's an existing builder running. If not, it starts one up for you with, with default settings. Um, once the builder pod is running, it uses the equivalent of a kube control exec to get a pipe into the pod. Uh, then it uses the build kit gRPC API to talk to the builder over that pipe. By using exec to talk to the builder, we're able to rely on Kubernetes native RBAC for access control. Now, by default, these builder pods are privileged. We mount the container runtime socket so that they can talk to the runtime for that cluster node. What's cool about this is now every image you build is immediately available for the Kubernetes cluster to use. <clears throat> now, you wouldn't want to run the builder in this way on a production cluster, as anyone who has exact permissions into the pod uh, would be able to inject images into your cluster. But for a development cluster, this is extremely powerful and efficient. And you can choose to disable this and run a non-privileged builder, uh, but then you'll have to push the image to a registry or save it off locally in order to use it. Now, if you do want to push to a registry, we use standard Kubernetes image pull secrets so the builder can push directly. <clears throat> so if you have multiple nodes in your cluster, you can scale up the deployment for the builder to get pods running on all the nodes. When you build an image, it gets built on one node, and then at the end of the build, we use the CLI, or the CLI helps transfer that image across to all the other pods, all the other pods. This makes your image available on all the nodes. Uh, so if you try to run a pod with that new image you just built, uh, it won't matter where Kubernetes schedules it. This does mean that you'll need a fast network between the CLI and your cluster, unless your images are really small. Now, if you push to a registry, uh, we skip this replication step. In the future, we're planning to implement a pod-to-pod -pod transfer model so that you can build larger images on a distant cluster without a performance hit. Okay, so why did we build this thing? We know that there's a lot of different ways to build container images in Kubernetes that are out there. And some of those tools are actually really great. There are, however, still a lot of people who are using Docker build. It's just really easy, um, it just works. So 
A lot of those other tools though, they, they require you to use a registry and many of them require a lot of setup and the images aren't available locally. Um, the other thing that we see, which is happening around Kubernetes is that people are moving away from the Docker, from Docker D as being the default container runtime. But people have built up scripts and automation and muscle memory around building images. So we wanted to create something which was close to the, the same experience that they already have. So the build kit project was started back in 2017 to create a more powerful toolkit for converting source to build artifacts like container images. So Patrick and I were both working at Docker at the time. Um, we were not part of the build kit project itself, uh, but although we were working on some downstream projects that used build kit. So build kit itself is a really great tool. Um, it's compatible with the latest Docker file features. So it takes your Docker file and creates a graph for all the build steps. And then it can run those steps in parallel to create your container image. It only transfers files from your local directory if they're actually used during the build. And it's smart about tracking if files have changed for better incremental builds. To make incremental builds faster, it can cache those build results locally on the builder or even within a registry. So that enables multi-node build farms to build faster. The thing I wanted to call out was that it's actually really good at building multi-architecture builds as well, which is what I use all the time for things like those Docker deals that we were looking at earlier. So let's take a look at another demo showing the power of a fast developer interlude. So let's briefly describe the setup that I've got in my environment. So I've got a Mac laptop running Fusion. Um, so if I do a VM run list, so you can see I've got one VM running right now. Um, let's do a control get nodes. So we can see I, this is actually a two node cluster. Right now I'm not running my second node, um, but sometimes I'll use that for demos. Uh, for this demo, I'm just gonna use a single node. Um, so it is a simple Ubuntu VM running container D as the runtime. Okay, um, if I do a get pods, you can see I've got nothing running, so I haven't booted up my, my builder yet. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the demo setup itself. Um, so I'll start with a really simple Docker file. So the Docker file is, uses BusyBox as the base layer. Uh, and all it does is copy in the command and set that as the entry point. So let's take a look at that command. So this is just a really simple shell script um, just to kind of demonstrate uh, a fast inner loop um, to kind of simulate, uh, you know, if you actually had code that you were, were adding here in your application. So all it does is just spit out a date and a hello world with a number, and we can increment that to see the inner loop. To kind of, again, simulate what, what a developer will be doing as you're, as you're writing code in that, that fast inner loop. All right, and then let's look at our application definition. So what I've got set up here is, again, kind of to help optimize for a developer inner loop. Um, we've got the deployment. Uh, I've got the strategy set to recreate. Um, so instead of doing a rolling update, uh, it's gonna immediately terminate the old pods and spin up the new pods. Um, a few other settings of note in here. I've got my image pull, image pull policy set to never. Uh, that's to make sure that I'm always using the image that I've built locally. Um, we're not trying to pull this from our registry. Um, again, we're trying to do a, a fast inner loop where it's local development on my, my local kube environment. We've got a restart policy set to always. Um, so it's always gonna restart uh, the, the, uh, the pod uh, and a termination grace period set to zero. So that's gonna make it faster to terminate and shut down the old pods. So all of this should help uh, to kind of build up that fast in our loop. So as a developer, I write some code, compile, and then test. Um, now in a production environment, obviously you'd have different settings, but this kind of helps, helps uh, optimize that inner loop. All right, so let's go ahead and actually build the image. So we'll just cut and paste that in. All right, so what it's doing right now is actually booting up the builder. And you can see that it's actually attempting to use Docker, uh, but the Docker runtime failed, and it's gonna retry with Containerd. And the reason we do that is uh, Dockerd is still the most popular container runtime out there in the wild, um, and even though folk, a lot of folks are switching over to Containerd. Um, as many folks know, Docker actually has Containerd under the covers. So if we started with Containerd by default, um, we might incorrectly assume that your cluster is using Containerd uh, and not realize that Docker is sitting on top of it. Um, so kind of for simplicity for now, we, we default to Docker and then we'll flip back to container D uh, if, if Docker's not detected. Um, so you can see that was all automatic, didn't have to do anything. Um, you can, uh, if you're manually creating the builder, um, you can explicitly specify that you wanna use the container D runtime and that will kind of short circuit that, that auto detection logic. Um, so you can see it took it about 17 seconds to attempt Docker, fail, and then restart or retry with container D. Now that at this point, the builder's already running. Um, so if I do any subsequent builds, it'll immediately be available um, and I can just jump right into my build. 
Um, let's look at a few other things uh, in the output here. Um, so we can see it's it's pulling the, the base layer of library busybox, um, and that was able to resolve uh, in the container D image cache. Um, <clears throat> then it copied in the image, uh, and that was pretty much it for this Docker file. Right? There was no compilation or anything like that, um, like we saw in, in Patrick's demo. Um, finally, what it's doing is just exporting it to an image um, and tagging it with the, the tag that I specified. And so at this point, that image is now loaded into my container runtime and available on those nodes. Now, if I had my second node running, it would have transferred the image over to that second node as well. Um, and so now both nodes would be able to run, run this image. So let's go ahead and uh, get the application running. If we do a get pods, we can now see both the build kit builder, which is running and ready to go for, uh, for the next invocation, um, or the next time I build an image, and I've got my app running as well. Now what I'm going to do over in this terminal window um, is I'm actually do a little loop, um, so just kind of an infinite while loop. Uh, Kube control logs, uh, do a follow on the logs, I'm going to use a label selector for app equals my app. Uh, what this will let me do is in this terminal it will continue to follow the log output even as I iterate. Right, so we'll go ahead and start that up. So you can see it's just continually spitting out hello world with a date, tamp, uh, uh, date stamp uh, every three seconds or so. Okay, so now let's kind of do a simulation of a developer inner loop. So I'm going to write some code, make some changes, recompile, um, and see my code running. So we'll go ahead and modify this program to keep it simple. We'll just say hello world 2. So we'll write that out. And now I'm going to repeat the build command, but I'm going to do one little difference here. So after I build it, what I'm going to do is, if that's successful, I'm going to do a kube control delete pod with a label selector app equals my app. So what that's going to do is if the build failed, it'll stop. But if the build succeeded, it's going to go ahead and delete the pod where app equals my app. So that should delete this pod and allow the deployment and the Kubernetes scheduler to detect the pods dead uh, and automatically restart the pod, which will pick up the new image that I just built. So let's go ahead and see that work. Voila. So there we go. Within a second or so, we've got Hello World 2 coming out. And you can see that the build took uh, much shorter this time. Uh, we didn't have to bootstrap the builder. It was already present and running. Um, all we did was copy in the new command uh, and export the layers. So there you go. Nice, fast inner loop, uh, optimized for developers. Immediately have your images available on your local system. Um, works on single nodes, works on multi nodes as well. All right, so let's actually look at how you would go about creating a customized builder if you wanted to. Um, so first, let's go ahead and delete the builder that we already have. OK, um, so one thing I should mention real quick. So we've been showing kube control build as the uh, kind of primary UX uh, or the primary CLI commands that you would run because it makes it feel uh, very similar to the way the Docker build works. Um, that's actually an alias to build kit build. Um, and so we have a number of different commands underneath kube control build kit. So if we say kube control build kit help, um, we can see build is one of the sub commands of build kit, um, which again is just an alias to kube control build. Um, there's other commands that you can do under the build kit uh, top level command. Um, so you can create a new builder, uh, list existing builders, because you can create multiple builders with different configurations, uh, remove your builders. Um, I was just using kube control delete for the deployment, but you could also use the rm command under build kit uh, as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at build kit create help. So there's a lot of command flags here. Um, we're not going to go through all of them, but uh, just a kind of a real quick summary. So this allows you to manually or explicitly create a builder um, so you can tune and, and, and optimize the configuration of it uh, based on what you want in your environment. So this would be how you would uh, set it up to run rootless if you wanted to have kind of a deep privileged environment. Um, you can pass in specific flags to the build kit daemon inside of the builder uh, if you want to tune and again kind of modify the behavior of build kit uh, and pass in a specific build kit config file if you already have one that you've uh, kind of set up or if you want to customize that that, that setup uh, the one I'll, I'll show just real quick as an example is the runtime flag um, so by default we have it set up to do auto which kind of does that auto detection logic i talked about um, you can also specify the uh, runtimes explicitly so for this one I'll, I'll show you kind of using container d explicitly so it doesn't have to do the, the automatic detection 
So let's say could control build kit, create, runtime container D. And so now we'll go ahead and boot up the, the builder with container D immediately. We don't have to try Docker or fail and then fall back to container D. So you can see it was much faster to get started. And I'd be ready to run uh, and start doing builds now. So I mentioned, uh, I mentioned multi-arch support a few minutes ago, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit more. When I say multi-arch, what I mean is that if you've got nodes in your cluster, which are running, let's say, x86-64 Linux or ARM Linux or even Windows. So for example, I'm running a personal cluster at home that's got a mix of PCs and Raspberry Pis running Linux to do some home automation. So how do you get a common image tag to run across all of those nodes. You could make images with different tags for each one of those different architectures. But if you want a single deployment to scale across each one of those or each of those nodes, it has to have a single Im image definition. You can already see examples of these types of images, which are on Docker Hub right now, um, where most of the library images are already multi-arch. So uh, if you pulled something like Postgres or the Redis images, It'll just work on whatever architecture you're using. What's cool about BuildKit is that it lets you easily build these types of images. Uh, and there are three different ways of doing it. You can build natively on the target architectures, which we don't support quite yet, but we are working on that. You can also potentially use an emulator such as Q QEMU or to, to emulate those different architectures. And if you're using an interpreted language like Python or Node or a compiled language which supports cross compilation like Go um, or Rust or, or even Java, it's pretty easy to do. You can uh, do this in languages like C and C++, but it usually takes a little bit more effort to get your tool chain to work. One big caveat that I should mention though is with multi-arch images is that if, um, you, for now, you have to, to push it to uh, push your images to a registry when you're doing the build. Um, but we have been looking at ways to assemble them locally, which wouldn't require you to do that push. So um, it's still a little bit tricky to get the cross compilation working. There's a bunch of changes that you're, you're going to need to do to your Docker file to get it to work. If you're familiar with multi-stage builds inside of Docker files, this should look relatively straightforward. Um, in this particular example, uh, there are four different stages. And in the first stage, what happens is we're going to build um, for each one of the different build platforms. It actually gets executed um, once for every one of the platforms that you're using. The second and third stages of the Docker file are required to get the correct base image for whatever architecture that you're that you're trying to target. So in this case, there's a release Linux and a release Windows stage. Um, in Linux, I'm just copying, I'm using from scratch, and I'm just copying the, the built executable to that. In the case of Windows, I'm having to use Nano Server. So unfortunately, it's a lot bigger than just using from scratch. Um, but then I copy over the, the newly built executable over to it. Um, and then, I, of course, I set up the entry points for both of those. The last stage is actually kind of like the magic sauce that BuildKit uses to assemble each one of the architectures. The target OS and target arch and the build platform variables that you can see in the Docker file um, are variables which are automatically set by BuildKit. And they're pulled out of the platform argument that when you're executing the kube control build itself. All right, so what, what environments can you run this on? Um, so we've tested this on Kubernetes versions 1.14 and up. So pretty much every supported stable version of Kubernetes today works. Um, as far as runtimes, uh, we support both container D and Docker D runtimes. Uh, additional runtimes could be added in the future. As far as distros, uh, most distros should just work. Um, some Kubernetes distros like K3D use some special tricks around how they set up their container runtime. Uh, in these cases, we currently aren't able to mount the container runtime socket to load up the images. Um, so you can still use the tool on those, those kind of distros, um, but you'll need to use a registry and push the images to the registry. Um, so you won't be able to do the immediate build and run uh, like we showed in the demos today.
All right, so this is a really young project. Um, we do have native OS packaging for Mac OS, Windows, Linux um, to make it a little bit easier to get installed. Um, go take a look, give it a try. Uh, we're always looking for help. So if this is interesting to you, give us a hand. Uh, pick up an open issue, submit a pull request, join the community. Help us define what the 1.0 release should look like. Thanks for coming and watching our talk. We'll open it up uh, Q&A now.